All right, good morning, everybody. We are on 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the love chapter. <clears throat> and uh, it's 13 verses, and we'll, we'll get on in there. And um, I expect you probably have a lot to say because most of you probably <clears throat> had this read at your weddings. It's kind of like the, the wedding chapter, although there's nothing in here that's like particular to weddings because it relates to the whole of our life as, as Christians. So we'll just give an overview. I'm just going to speak to my heart a little bit. I maybe have like one commentary comment. Um, I might read through the Amplified a little bit just to sort of flesh it out because uh, we're, I mean, we're going to use the King James, of course. But sometimes the Amplified gives more adjectives to some of these words. Uh, looking at, it looks at the original language and it kind of just gives it, fleshes it out a little bit as an interpretation, I kind of see the Amplified as kind of like a, an interpretation in and of itself. And uh, just to really sort of marinate on the richness of this chapter, because I don't really, I feel like this just speaks to all of us in ways that my words are really sort of limited. Um, it is interesting that when we look at 1 Corinthians, really chapters 12 through 14 are a sustained argument on how spiritual gifts should function in the church, uh, certainly how they should function in the Corinthian church, which was very disordered and um, really, really kind of a, a poster child for problems as far as churches go, yet was extremely endowed with gifts of the spirit at the same time. You could be, you could be filled with the Holy Spirit and, and be really messed up. <laughs> it's a takeaway. <laughs> we can and that's why we really, when it comes to Christian leadership, um, churches have paid far too much attention to a man's giftedness. Uh, they should pay a lot more attention to his fruit as the basis for leadership. Because out of good fruit, those gifts will have a good basis to operate appropriately. And so chapter 13 is sort of wedged in between, well, of course it's wedged in between chapters 12 and 14, but it, it really when you first look at it, it almost looked like there's a break in the argument because 12 is talking about the diversity of gifts and different gifts given to different people in the body of Christ and how God can even use all these gifts in our lives. And then 14, of course, as you're going to see, has a lot to say about prophecy and tongues and, and just, again, how that's supposed to uh, work out in the assembly. But verse 13, it's almost like the love chapter is dropped in the middle of this argument. But the point is this is how gifts are supposed to operate. They're supposed to operate in the context of love because if we don't have love, we don't have anything. If we don't have love, relationships get destroyed. Assemblies get destroyed. And so we're going to just talk about it. Um, I'm going to read a little bit and then we'll talk. Uh, Father, in the name of Jesus, please allow us to open up your word. And, and Father, I ask that you'd open up your word to us, Lord, that you would teach us today, that you would share with us what love looks like in the Christian life and in your, your church and how we should treat each other and how we should walk with each other, uh, both um, in the positive examples of what love is and in what love is not, which this chapter does talk about. And so teach us, Lord, send your Holy Spirit to enlighten us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so he starts off. Um, I'll read a few verses. Uh, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinking cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profit me nothing. Charity suffers long and is kind. Charity envies not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. 
whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away with. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, and then I shall know, even as I am also known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. Now, so he starts off and he says, though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not charity, I have become a sounding brass or as sounding brass or a tinking cymbal. It's been stated that in some of the, the mystery religions nearby that sometimes they would uh, try to summon the attention of the gods by clanging brass and cymbals. And even in some traditional religions today, they beat a lot of pots and brass and cymbals in order to get the attention of the spirits or perhaps chase away the spirits. That's what they think they're doing at least. <laughs> they're attracting the spirits. But it's an idea that you could somehow get God's attention, you know, that way is, um, is nonsense. And that's basically what tongues sound like without love. That if you don't have love, and I like how the King James translates love as charity, because we tend to think of love as just sentiment, like, like some kind of uh, Hollywood movie, romance. But love is inherently active. Love is a verb. And so if you translate it as charity, agape is charity, is, is, is basically it's this idea that love is is outward, that it's self-sacrificial, it's self-giving, it's other-oriented, uh, that idea that you'd lay down your life for others. Um, it doesn't flow out of everything that you want. It's, it's based on a higher principle. And so um, if a person, in other words, so we're talking about spiritual gifts here in the section of chapters 12 through 14, you could have all, the, you could have every language on the earth, and Paul's making a rhetorical argument here. I don't know that Paul had every tongue on earth or every angelic tongue. I think his point is like, even if I did, even if I, if I had all the tongues known to both men and angels, if I don't have love, it's not going to do any good for me. And uh, if, you know, this is the more excellent way that Paul is showing us that we saw in verse 31 of the verse that goes right above this of chapter 12. Again, we got to remember these chapter numbers are not inspired. This is a sustained argument here. This is love is the more excellent way that he's showing us. That Paul's showing us. That. And so this also shows us that, you know, that speaking in tongues, uh, some make the argument that speaking in tongues is always a known human language. But I would say the most straightforward argument of seeing it here is that there are also tongues of angels. Amen. Uh, some of the some of the Jews thought that a, that the angels spoke in Hebrew, and perhaps they preferred that at times. I don't know, but here it clearly talks about angelic tongues. And so, if if your tongue sounds like gibberish, be of good cheer. Perhaps uh, it's an angelic tongue, you know, uh, tongues that we don't know about. And so, I think that's that's something that we could draw out of this this passage here: tongues of men and of angels. But the idea is that all of this is to be girded up with charity, with love. Otherwise, like I said, you're just a, a bunch of noise. You're a bunch of noise. And kind of like it reminds me of the Old Testament where people would even, you know, they would, they would give alms and they would, they would give sacrifices. But God is like, it's a bunch of noise to me. I don't want your sacrifices. I don't even want your prayers because you're not doing justice to those around you. You're not doing justice to the widow. You're not doing justice to the orphan. You know, you're not, you're not loving. You're not obeying my commandments to love. You know, you're the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. So in our, in the Corinthian assembly, if they're not loving each other, when they go take the communion meal, as we see here, as, as we're going to see, when they go and take communion together, the rich are bringing their food and they're gorging themselves and the poor that are coming in later because they're servants and slaves and they got to work all day and there's no food left for them. And the rich are getting drunk on their wine. You know, Paul has a problem. They're not sharing love. 
they're not very loud. So they're becoming like sounding brass. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, though I have all faith that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. So even if you, you, you're a prophetic person, you're a gifted person, you want to have the title apostle, prophet, you know, even though, you know, apostles and prophets are the foundation, well, Christ is the foundation. Anyway, I don't even know, like Pastor Charlie says, I, I think one could be an apostle in a sense of being a missionary, like Barnabas and Silas. Okay, if you, if you plan it, if you want to call yourself apostle, then you should probably be overseeing four or five churches and overseeing the pastors of those churches as a missionary. Otherwise, I don't think the title really even fits at all. But I know that's another, another teaching altogether. Um, anyway, so, but even if you, you have all these gifts, but if you don't have love, even if you have the faith that you can remove a mountain, Good. which is, which in other words, you could do the impossible. In other words, you're doing like greater miracles. You're not just doing miracles. We have a hard time seeing miracles, unfortunately. We're supposed to be seeing miracles. We're not just deliverance people. We're supposed to be full gospel where we lay the hands on the sick and they recover, like the Bible yeah. says. We got to believe that. We got to do that. And that's another, that's another sermonette that a lot of us deliverance, we're big on casting out demons, but what about the other stuff, right? But, but you know, even if you could do the greater miracles that the Bible talks about, if you don't have love, the point is it's... What does it what does it matter? Jesus came out of love. He saved us out of his love. God could have come down here with power. And that's what most of the Jews wanted. They wanted Messiah to come with power and extinguish the enemies of God, incinerate them in an instant. All Romans dead. That's what they wanted. That's what they were hoping for to restore the national hopes of Israel. But Jesus came as a lamb to the slaughter. He came in humble love and died on a cross and this is the god we're supposed to emulate the god that has all power the god of justice who will come with wrath don't get me wrong but shows us the example of love and that's how we're supposed to be as his people that's what he wants that's how he wants the church to function and so if we don't have this kind of love i am nothing and that's what paul says he's laid out his life and don't get me wrong Paul got irritated at times. We, we could see his arguments to the Galatians is like, well, if you're so big on this, I'm wanting people to be circumcised, why don't you go all the way? You know, but sometimes he lets his, 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 you know, his emotions show, right? But uh, nonetheless, he realizes that we got to be girded by love and forgiveness. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profits me nothing. That almost seems on the surface, like, what are you talking about? If you give your body over to death for the sake of your cause, but you don't have love, it amounts to nothing. Yeah. He's saying that real charity and real love is something that flows out of the heart of the person. And there's people that give their lives for all kinds of causes. And it might not be rooted in love. True agape, true self-oriented, others-oriented love. You know, maybe maybe someone's given their life for a, a, a cause because they want people to, to realize how righteous they are, to realize how holy they are, to realize how right they are. But if it doesn't flow from love, it's nothing. If it doesn't flow from charity, it's nothing. And I know, I know a lot of people that give a lot of stuff away that, you know, and it's it's this sense of like. I'm right, you know, the cause that I'm doing is, is true. And I, I know a lot of people that live alternate lifestyles that give a lot of money and that think that vindicates their, their sexual choices because they give a lot of money to charity. And they're like, well, I give just as much money as Christians. So therefore, you know, like God loves me because I'm a giving person. Like, well, it's good that you're a giving person, but if that doesn't come out of the agape love of the cross of Jesus Christ, in obedience to him, it doesn't really avail much. No. Oh. Uh, charity suffers long and is kind. Charity envies not. Charity vault, vault, vaulteth not itself, is not puffed up. So this shows us that now it's showing us what, what love is. 
you know, that, that, it, that it is long suffering. It's patient, mm. um, patient more than we want it to be. When we see, I, I see how much, how far I have to go. When I see how irritated I could get when these little, these, I get, I love my, I do love my kids. It's not like I don't love them, but you know, after a while it starts to get to you all the noise and it sort of builds up and I, and I notice I'll get irritated and I'll sort of snap a little bit. That's my problem. That's not theirs. They're just being kids. That irritation shows me that I need the agape love in my heart at a much deeper level, much deeper level. That's because cherry, because love is long suffering, you know? And we're going to get to it because the love doesn't mean that you're a doormat either. I think this chapter covers the basis. So from our end, where there is a long suffering that has to come from love that we do bear with our brother. It's kind. Um, love is kind. It's, uh, it's, that's not cruel. It's not mean. It's gentle with other people. Uh, charity envies not. And we, we're not envious of other people's goods. It's, we should rejoice when other people get blessed. If somebody comes into a big inheritance of money or if somebody is a real gifted teacher or if somebody hears from God, we shouldn't always think that everything they have is counterfeit necessarily. We, we should, you know, maybe, maybe God is speaking to them. I don't know. We should judge the fruit. Don't get me wrong. I'm trying to cover my own basis here, but you know, we should have a general heart that wants to rejoice in others' blessings. Mm. We, we should, we should, we should bless others, be happy for their, happy for their growth. Because if we're envious that's going to be a spiritual cancer to our souls. And we're going to always be jealous and envious of others. Uh, we should rejoice when other people get blessed. We should rejoice in their ministry. You know, they, maybe they're, maybe God wants to increase them for a while. And maybe we get decreased for a while. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Uh, let John the Baptist be our model there. You know, and he just sort of stepped away in a way. So Jesus could, could move forward. Um, and so charity envies not, charity vault, uh, vaunteth not itself. In other words, it doesn't puff itself up. It doesn't like, it's not like, hey, look at me. Look how special I am. Pay attention to me, you know. That's what immature people do. Uh, maturity is like, you know what? I'm confident in my relationship with God. And I've had to do this myself because, you know, I used to be in ministry. I used to be a pastor and I, I miss that. Honestly, I miss a lot about that, but that's not the road I'm at. Um, I've taken a different path and I was in the pastor in the wrong churches for one. That was, that was my big mistake. Uh, but you know, like it's, it's good to just be a dad and to try to take care of my kids in what ways I can right now. It's, it's good to get guidance from the Lord. It's good to be humble. It's good to be made low in many ways, you know, it's, yeah. that's, I'm actually um, starting to enjoy it in many ways. Um, uh, charity envy is not charity vault, uh, vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up. Um, you know, we don't let others see our gifts. We don't have to. It kind of reminds me of like some of the toughest guys, like when I was in high school, didn't have to go around showing their toughness. Some, some of the bullies were not even that tough. Off of it. I mean, they're a little bit tough, but they weren't the toughest. It's the toughest I've ever had to see. <laughs> And I think that's how it is in spiritual matters too. You know, we should, we don't have to puff ourselves up. Uh, we, there, pe people know, uh, people know. Um, let's see, uh, charity, verse five, doth not behave itself unseemly, uh, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. So love, you know, charity, this, this others oriented, uh, self-giving love, this charity, it's, it's, not a, it's not an inappropriate type of love. I mean, this is important because people have wrong ideas of what love is, especially people who have been abused in life or, Lord forbid, have been molested. They get some bad ideas of what love looks like. Love is not, I'll do whatever you want me to do because you're asking me, right? Now, this is important. Love does not behave unseemly. Love is appropriate. Love is ordered. Love is pure and holy. Love is good. Love doth not, seeketh not her own. A love isn't selfish. So if somebody wants to selfishly take of your time and ministry and prayers all day long, and they're not making the requisite changes in their life, sometimes you have to give them tough love and say, well, you get back with me 
after you've done these things, after you've forgiven these people and shown it by your actions towards them, Amen. by going and apologizing, by going and returning money you've stolen or whatever the case may be. Uh, and that's important for us that are involved in prayer and deliverance ministries is some people just want to take, 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 take. They're like energy vampires. Literally, their demons will want to siphon your life off from you. And sometimes we got to say, no, I'm following the Lord here. I'm following my own discernment here. And uh, we, I need to tell you seriously what I think you need to do here because you're not loving your own self. And, I'm not, and I know you know what kind of people I'm talking about. I have some of these people in my life. I think Pastor Charlie probably has many of these people in his life. I don't know. <laughs> forgive, forgive me. But uh, uh, yeah, so love doesn't love. Uh, charity suffers long suffering. It's kind. It envies not. It, it's puffed up. Not, I've already read this, so I'm kind of going through it. It seeks not her own. It's, um, it's not easily provoked. So again, uh, again, if we find ourselves being retaliatory, and that's something I've always struggled with. That's something I've tried to get a lot of deliverance from. Is I have a, a sense of like a being retaliatory. If you if you if you hurt me, you know, like I want to retaliate. Sometimes I hold it in and I'll be all calm and cool, but in deep within, I'm like, man, I want to punch this guy. <laughs> you know, and that's something I have to repent and, and deal with. Um, love is not easily provoked. Love thinketh no evil. And so, and I would say it thinketh no evil of others. You know, it realizes like, like Steve oftentimes tells us, it's not them, it's what's in them. It's the demons that are within that get us festered. Now we have to take responsibility. We can't blame demons for our own sinful choices that we choose. But the demons are so closely associated with the sin itself that it's very difficult to tell the one from the other because the demons just put fire on that sin itself. When we give ourselves over to that old man, the demons just inflame that to really they're very close to being one and the same, honestly. It's very hard to distinguish the two in many ways. And really, we, we should treat them the same regardless. You know, well, I mean, we, we crucify the flesh and we cast out demons, but either one we're rebuking, either one we're renouncing. Anyway, so, um, so love rejoices, charity rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. So, you know, we don't rejoice in the sins of others. And sometimes some Christians like to see other people fall. They like to see them fail, you know. I know when I left um, the Eastern Orthodox Church, you know, most people were very generous and did love me and missed me, you know, really, truly. But I did get the sense there are a few people that wanted to see me fail because they think that their church is the true church, right? So they want to see me fail. They want to see me broken. They, they want to see me, you know, have health issues. They want to see me not, you know, serve the Lord, you know. And uh, that's a very sad, broken state if you want to see other people fail. That's, that's, a, that's a very terrible spiritual disease in and of itself. Love does not want to see other people fail. It wants to see people whole. It wants to see, it does see people, want to see people repent, but not in a self-righteous way, like where you pity them, like you're high, like you're better than them. No, love comes down beside people and say, says, brother, sister, like, I'm here with you. I need, I need Jesus. And so do you. We, we need the Lord. We need, we need restoration. Because um, love, true charity rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. So it's, there's this long suffering that comes with true love and charity. It's able to bear with the weaknesses of others. I think because really we're doing it out of the overflow of God's mercy and grace. We're not bearing any of this on our own strength. If we do that, we're going to fail. But we're bearing it from Christ within us who gives us that strength because um, he is the vine and we are the branches. Because apart from him, we can do nothing. So as we follow the Lord Jesus as we get our life from our source of life. And that's what Jesus is. He's our literal life, Christ within. As we walk with him and our own 
obedience and our own repentance and our own crying out to him day and night for our own sins and transgressions. And as we cry out to others, even if we don't want to, as we cry out to others, even if we don't feel like we love them, who cares what you feel like? As we do that, his very life will give us that ability to bear all things and to believe all things, even for them. I, I've got some friends that are so bound up with some things that are really, really bad. But to believe, to believe that, you know, that Jesus can set them free. To believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Because this life is just the preparation for eternity to come. This life itself is a battleground. It's, a, it's the epilogue to a book. It's the opening chapter to a world without end. And so we can endure all things as a good soldier for Jesus Christ because we're passing through this life, preparing for the next. Because chair, and I'm going to read, I'm going to read, I wanted to read the Amplified for some reason. So I'll read that here, stop at verse seven. And just, I'd like you just to sort of listen to it because maybe it'll sort of parse this out a little bit um, with some of the extra additional adjectives. And I'll just read it. If I can speak in the tongues of men and even of angels, but have not love, that reasoning, intentional, spiritual devotion, such as inspired by God's love for and in us, I am only a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers, the gift of interpreting the divine will and purpose, and understand all the secret truths and mysteries and possess all knowledge, and if I have sufficient faith so that I can remove mountains but have not love, God's love in me, I am nothing, a useless nobody. Even if I dole out all that I have to the poor in providing food, and if I surrender my body to be burned or in order that I may glory, but have not love, God's love in me, I gain nothing. Love endures long and is patient and kind. Love never is envious nor boils over with jealousy, is not boastful or vainglorious, does not display itself haughtily. It is not conceited, arrogant, or inflated with pride. It is not rude, unmannerly. It does not act unbecomingly. Love, God's love in us, does not insist on its own rights or its own way, for it is not self-seeking. It is not touchy or fretful or resentful. It takes no account of the evil done in it. It pays no attention to wrongs suffered. It pays no attention to a suffered wrong. It does not rejoice at injustice and unrighteousness, but rejoices when right and truth prevail. Love bears up under anything and everything that comes. It is ever ready to believe the best of every person. Its hopes are fadeless under all circumstances, and it endures everything without weakening. I just thought, as I read that, I just thought it was helpful to, to read it for you too, because it, I just thought it would bring out some of those adjectives a little bit. And I think it does for me. And I think it's, for me, it's, I feel a little convicted, to be honest with you. <laughs> I see ways I fall short, but it's a clean conviction. It feels good. It feels good because it shows me how much more is available to, my, to me through Jesus Christ. You know, it shows how much more love that I could have, how much more I can experience. I think of Steve with all those animals blocking over him in miraculous ways. And, and um, you know, many, there have been even some, don't, don't get too flattered, Steve, maybe just slightly flattered, but uh, even people that would go out and spend time in the, the wilderness to grow close to God, a lot of them would form friendships with animals. Even bears would get tamed, you know, some of these saints who would love God with, with all their heart. But can we love each other like that? Because I know some people that are really close to animals too, but can we love each other with that kind of love? Um, can we love our enemies with that kind of love? You know, that's, that's, that's the heart of a Christian. Not only can we love animals, can we love our children? Can we love our spouse? Which that's really hard in some ways because you live with them all the time, you know? But can we love our enemies? 
know, we not only love our brothers and sisters of Christ, but we love our enemies. And so may this love flow into our heart. May it change us as we walk with Jesus, as we repent, as we seek him, as we fill our hearts with scripture. May this love literally change us. So let's, let's continue. Um, we, we stop with chapter, uh, with verse seven, I believe. Yep. So we'll, we'll continue with verse eight and following and read it out. Uh, Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. I guess we already read the chapter, so we'll, we'll, we'll comment here. So love never fails. And then again, Paul's argument is with sandwiched between, you know, it's basically 12 through 14 when he's trying to show them what, how you should use spiritual gifts in the Congress and the assembly. He's saying, look, love is the foundation because love doesn't change it. Spiritual gifts will cease someday. They're not cease now. We're continuationists because that's what the Bible teaches. The Bible doesn't teach the cessation of the spiritual gifts during the church age. We're living in the church age now. You know, in the last days, your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will dream visions, and you know, uh, the Joel's prophecy w- w- happened at Pentecost, and we're still in the church age. So the gifts are here. There's no indication that they've left. They've only ceased for those believers who don't want them, who don't do them out of faith, and um, who don't have that obedience, who aren't walking that walk. But love will never fail. Love will always remain. It'll love, there'll be love in the millennial kingdom and love in the kingdom to come. But charity never fails, but whether there'll be prophecies, they shall fail. We're not going to need to have prophecy when we see the thing face to face, when we see Jesus with reigning in full splendor and majesty, we're not going to need to prophecy about him anymore, will we? And so, um, there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. You know, tongues are to edify us now. Uh, I could see them being used in a missional setting, like, you know, perhaps. I mean, I think there's warrant for that interpretation. Uh, although that's not the primary purpose of tongues in scripture, it's to glorify God and to praise him um, and, to, and to be assigned to the Jews that the Gentiles incorporate in Christ as well. Um, but all these tongues and all these gifts are not going to be needed in the future when when christ is reigning in fullness they shall cease whether it be knowledge it shall pass it shall vanish away um knowledge certainly has not vanished away we we have knowledge now but we're not going to need any real additional knowledge you know on on spiritual matters when uh when again when that perfect will come um for we know in part and we prophesy in part but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away with. So again, a lot of these gifts are to encourage us, to build us up, to show that the kingdom of God is, is manifested and true amongst us. Uh, the gospel is to be preached with signs following. And so if your gospel doesn't have signs following, it's, it's not a complete gospel. But um, the perfect is not now. The perfect it's eisegetical. Eisegesis is when you read a doctrine into scripture that's not explicitly taught in that passage of scripture. So it's eisegetical to see the perfect as being the Bible being written. A lot of people believe that all the spiritual sign gifts passed once the Bible was fully written, but that's an interpretation that's not borne out by any text. In fact, all of the texts seem to indicate it just taken for granted that spiritual gifts would happen in the churches. And so um, when, when that just perfect has come, that which is in part shall be done away with. Again, we're not going to need tongues. We're not going to need prophecies. We're not going to need additional knowledge of things um, uh, when the perfect comes. And I can only see the perfect come and Jesus coming again. I don't know how else. I don't know what else could be perfect as except when Jesus comes again and makes everything right. <laughs> it makes everything right. Um, um, 
when I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put childish things away. And again, that's why Paul's telling these Corinthians, like, look, y'all need to love. You don't do communion right, as I alluded to. Uh, you don't, your sexual ethics are rancid, to say the least. You know, you're not, you're like children. You have all these gifts and you're like children with all their toys, banging their toys together and breaking them. You know, you're, you're childish is what he's telling them, basically. He's telling them you need, he's telling the Corinthians, you need to grow up. You're not spiritual, truly. The mark of a spiritual Christian is not gifts, it's, it's love. It's faith, hope, and love. That's the mark of a true spiritual man or woman of God. Um, love is the definitional mark of Christ within. Love is, is, the, is the sign of, of being truly spirit-filled, according to the Apostle Paul here in this chapter. Um, so we need to put a lot of these things away. And we need to put away, you know, as we reflect, as we go back and reflect on what love is and what love is, and as we've already discussed to a degree, those are things we need to put away. If we're not loving in a certain area, we need to put away some of these petty things, some of these prejudices, some of these judgments, some of these impulses, some of these selfish ways that we think we're loving, we're not. And we need to, we need to grow up a little bit. Praise the Lord. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know even as I am known. So the Corinthians were known in particular. Paul, Paul is a good preacher. He gives people analogies that they would relate to. And it was really well known in the ancient world that Corinth had the best mirrors. Now, mirrors back in that day were not, in that part of the world at least, they weren't, you know, the nice glass that we have that we can, you know, that, that can reflect us really well. Uh, but they were they were brass and they were they, they the Corinthians had the best Corinth was known to have the best polished brass mirror and at its best you know you'd either look really good or really bad I guess because it wouldn't be the kind of reflection that we're used to seeing it would be a dim reflection and um, so you wouldn't see um, as well as you might want to you wouldn't see in fullness. Let's put it that way. And so I, perhaps the Apostle Paul is saying that now we, we, we see, but we don't see as clearly as we would like to see, as, as, as we don't see as clearly as we will see when we see Jesus fully manifested in glory. And there's, there's a note here, and this, this Bible note might disagree with my interpretation. I don't know. But since it's a, a Bible commentator's note, I'll, I'll, I'll read it. Uh, we are seen through a mirror means of a dark image. Again, it, it shares the Corinth thing. Corinth was well known in the ancient world for producing some of the finest bronze mirrors available. Paul's point in this analogy then is, is not that our current understanding and relationship with God is distorted as if the mirror reflected poorly, but it, rather that it is indirect. The nature of looking at a mirror compared to the relationship we will enjoy with him in the future. So in other words, it's kind of uh, mediated in a sense, or it's indirect. That's what they're trying to say. The world indirectly translates from the Greek en, uh, enigmati, an obscure image, which itself may reflect an allusion to Numbers 12, 8, where God says that he speaks to Moses mouth to mouth and face to face, not in dark figures of speech. Although this allusion to the Old Testament is not explicitly developed here, it probably did not go unnoticed by the Corinthians who were apparently familiar with Old Testament traditions about Moses, as seen in chapter 10. Indeed, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul had recourse with the Corinthians in contrast to contrast Moses' ministry under the Old Covenant with the hope afforded through the apostolic ministry and the New Covenant. Further, it is this context, specifically in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, that the apostle invokes the use of the mere analogy, again, in order to unfold the nature of the Christian's progressive transformation by the Spirit. So perhaps we were, know, we were knowing by degrees. You know, God has unveiled salvation to us through Christ. We, right. see, we see more clearly than they did in the Old Covenant. But even now, there is a degree that we're going to see more clearly still when Jesus comes in the clouds 
and comes in his glory and the saints will will be will be I'll use the word rapture because that's uh, that just means caught up in the latin will be raptured up and we and he's going to reign triumphantly and put down his enemies and we're going to see he's going to right all wrongs he's going to wipe every tear from our eyes and so that's why we need the spiritual gifts now because we do see through a mirror darkly and that's why we need to love each other and forgive each other and be long suffering for each other and why we need to instruct each other in what appropriate love is too because love like we said is not unseemly and doesn't seek its own either and thinketh no evil so there's instructions in both how to give and re how to both give and receive love in this chapter and that's what we're called to do we're called to grow up and we're called to live together uh, because the world will know we're Christians by our love, as Paul says elsewhere. So I'll finish there. God bless you. Look forward to your comments. Thanks for letting me uh, talk today. It's good for me.